put in charge. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's glad to see all of you here today morning for our session of TERC. I'm George Paulson, and I'm from Pune. I worship with the Kharki Assembly there. And uh, for the last uh, year or so, I've been at Hosu at the Asian Christian Academy uh, doing biblical studies here. And uh, on behalf of TERC, I'd like to welcome all of you to this session on Christology. Uh, we'd especially like to welcome Brother Thomas Jacob, who will be taking this session for us. Uh, we've already had a couple of classes uh, regarding the subject, and we've seen how uh, we've seen aspects regarding the deity of Christ. And in the last lecture, we saw how uh, Christ was assigned various titles, uh, which uh, showed that the early church clearly, right from the beginning, uh, unambiguously attributed to him uh, divinity and saw that he was divine, uh, that he was God. And um, the subject is one that uh, should be dear to all of us. And let's uh, prayerfully sit in God's presence and pray that he will open our eyes uh, to understand the person and work of Christ uh, and that it will transform our lives uh, in a fundamental way. Uh, shall we pray and commend this meeting uh, and our dear brother into the hands of the Lord? Oh God, most high, we come to you in the, name, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you for this day that you have given us in our lives. Uh, every day is a blessing and also a responsibility to use the time and the opportunities given to us uh, in a manner that glorifies your name. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the ministry of TERC and uh, the burden that you have set on the hearts of many to uh, to bring uh, clarity to your word uh, to all who are in the churches. We thank you that uh, you're given a burden uh, for all to be equipped to uh, study scripture for themselves uh, and to, uh, in that sense, grow in the knowledge and wisdom of who you are. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you send him onto the earth. We thank you that uh, in the person of Christ, we have the greatest revelation of who God is. We thank you that he made the Father known to us. And we thank you that we know who God is in a much more beautiful and greater sense because of, uh, because of his life and his work. We pray, Lord, that as we uh, spend time before your word to study uh, Christology and uh, as we listen from Brother, uh, Brother Thomas Jacob, we pray, Lord, that uh, you would open our eyes to wonderful truths, that you would uh, draw us in to understand who your son is, and through that, that we may love uh, you more. That as we love you more, uh, that you will give us uh, an all-consuming desire to be like your son, uh, to show forth in this world, uh, as much as is humanly possible, uh, a Christ-like life. And uh, even as we seek to live Christ-like Christ -like lives, and as we love him more, that we may have an all-consuming desire to also make him known to others, uh, that we may make disciples, and that your glory may fill the earth as the waters cover the seas. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, that all-consuming desire uh, uh, to be like you and to make you known. And as we sit for these studies, uh, that we may have yours to hear, and that you may give the uh, brother who is to share the message uh, clarity of thought and clarity in words. Uh, and over a period of time, may we have a great desire to also study the subject for ourselves. As we now sit before your word, we pray that uh, you would be with us, uh, as you always are, and that you would uh, show us wonderful truths from your word. And bless the time that is there ahead of us. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amy. Well, Thomas Jacob, uh, you may take your time. Okay, thank you, brother. Good morning, all of you. May the name of the Lord be glorified. God has given us one more opportunity to have this time of spiritual fellowship together. And we are all uh, being benefited from the studies uh, from various po uh, portions of the scripture through this ministry. The Lord has given me the opportunity to discuss with you various aspects of Christology 
and we all know that it is the study of our lord jesus christ that makes us uh, more intelligent worshipers of our lord and we would be able to live for the lord as we live in this world last uh, week we were looking to the divine names and titles of our lord jesus christ uh, i am uh, i could not complete uh, that uh, topic so i would be uh, spending some initial moments uh, continuing that same uh, uh, title and then we will uh, proceed we were meditating upon the person of the lord jesus christ and especially his deity and uh, we meditated upon two uh, important things what one is the pre existence of christ and the second one is the divine names and titles given to our lord in uh, connection with this uh, divine names and titles the lord has enabled us to uh, go through uh, the uh, three titles where the jesus christ is called as god and where he is uh, uh, known as the jehovah uh, as the old, in the old testament and where he is also called as the son of god we uh, have looked into these details and the lord has helped us to uh, gather some important aspects of the various names uh, given to our lord i would like to uh, continue the same subject with the uh, uh, two other titles that is given to the lord and then we will proceed to the next uh, uh, topic and the first uh, title today we would be like to uh, we would be delighted to consider is the name uh, given to the lord as lord that is adonai in the uh, new testament in the greek language the word given is uh, curios and uh, this is a very familiar word both in the old testament and in the new testament uh even in the old testament the septuagint uh, the septuagint uh, version replaced the word adonai with the word uh, curios and we all know that this word means the one who has lordship over all the supreme in authority <clears throat> so that is a, a wonderful title uh, we can see in the new testament regarding our lord uh, jesus christ we all know that we are saved by acknowledging jesus as lord in our lives according to romans uh, chapter 10 and verse 9 we came to the knowledge of salvation that experience of salvation by accepting jesus christ as our personal lord and savior not only that we have confessed our sins but we have also uh, believed that jesus christ is Uh, our personal lord and savior so that is the uh, that that is the belief that is the faith that brought us to salvation brought us to be in connection with god so this title lord is very familiar for all of us and in fact we know that we have often misused this <laughs> title uh, as we have uh, prayed or preached or as we have talked to others and we have to be very careful as we use this title because when we say that he is my lord that means that he is my supreme authority he is the one who has the sovereign authority upon me but often personally we are not like that we do not commit ourselves to the lordship of christ so we have to be very careful as we use this title in our day to day life various aspects of the lordship of christ or christ pictured as the lord we can gather from the new testament and uh, one of the uh, those uh, titles or one of those references is uh, seen in acts chapter 10 and verse 36 we know the background of that passage apostle peter he was asked by the lord himself to visit the house of uh, uh, cornelius and he was uh, giving uh, a great and a detailed uh, description of the lord jesus christ Ooh. and as he preached the gospel over there he told very clearly that jesus christ he is the lord of all acts chapter 10 and verse 36 it's a familiar verse and we 
all may remember that verse i am not going to read it right now but we read there like this he is the lord of all so that is the that is the title that is due unto the lord jesus christ he is the lord of all <clears throat> many a time we uh, do not ascribe that full glory that is uh, that is due unto the lord jesus christ when we come to the gospels his human name jesus is mentioned often but when we come to the epistles we can understand that that full title that full glory of the lord jesus that uh, the lord jesus christ is mentioned time and again especially the writings of apostle paul and in other parts also we can see that so it is always good for us not only theologically but practically also that we have to use that full title of our lord as we uh, remember him as we meditate upon him and as we mention him uh, in our prayers and in our uh, communications the the name of our lord that full glory the lord jesus christ we have to ascribe him that we know that the word uh, jesus that is the human name of our lord it can be taken by many other people because uh, that was a common name uh, amongst the jews so <clears throat> that word jesus was common and we know that the uh, hebrew equivalent of that verse is joshua which we uh, also use nowadays even so it is always good to look to the lord and ascribing him as the lord of our lives and uh, calling him as lord so bible clearly says that uh, jesus christ he is the lord of all he is the lord when we search the scriptures we can see uh, one thing like this that there are times when this word curious or the word lord is ascribed to people as well and uh, for an example we can uh, we, we remember in acts chapter 16 while apostle paul was uh, in the philippian jail they uh, they prayed and they sang and there was a, a, a commotion there and the jailer told thought that uh, all the uh, all the prisoners might have escaped so he wanted to kill himself and at that time paul intervened and as a response to paul the jailer asked like this sirs and that word used there sirs is actually curious so it can be translated as lords so that word curious is used for uh, men as well not only to the lord jesus christ but we have to understand one uh, important thing there that word <coughs> is used uh, uh, as a word of respect to these people and in a similar way we can see the how that word is used in the uh, john's gospel chapter 12 and verse 21 where the 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 grecians they came and said like this sir we would like to see jesus so <clears throat> there that word sir again that word is curious and it can be translated as lord but that word is used there not accepting this uh, uh, philip as uh, uh, as their um, a lord but as a word of respect so uh, by the, uh, the by the circumstance by the context we can understand the meaning but when that word is used concerning the lord jesus christ we have to understand that it is not just a word of respect as we use the word sir but it is more than that it is acknowledging him as lord the one who is god himself when we come to uh, john chapter 20 and verse 28 we can see uh, the uh, the encounter of our lord jesus christ and apostle thomas when lord made himself known to his disciples in that closed room just after his resurrection thomas was not present there so after eight days in a group where john, uh, thomas himself was present our lord <coughs> came and, and showed himself and he rebuked the 
lack of faith on the part of Thomas. And as Thomas found that the Lord himself is resurrected indeed, he, his, heart, his heart was filled with worship. And he looked to the Lord and said, my Lord and my God. It is not just a word of respect, but more than that, it is a word that clearly says that my Lord, he is my God itself. So that is the meaning that is given when this word Lord is, uh, uh, is uh, given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is also uh, worth to understand that in the early, <coughs> early times, especially during the times of Ptolemies and Roman emperors, they would allow this name to be applied to them only when they permitted themselves to be defied. They, the archaeological discoveries, they put a, this fact beyond doubt. So when the New Testament writers, as they use this word, they clearly mean that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he is God himself. Before going further, let us just have a look how our Lord himself used this word concerning him. Please uh, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38. Again, that's a very familiar verse where our Lord uh, is asking his disciples to pray for the laborers because the harvest is truly plenteous and the laborers are few. So what they have to do, we are asked that, so pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers into the field. So our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of harvest. He is the one who calls people and, send, uh, and sends them to the harvest, to the field, to serve him. And uh, when we come to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8, Again, there we can see a reference where our Lord himself used this word Lord regarding him. There, the <coughs> discussion is about uh, the Sabbath day and uh, how uh, the Sabbath day should be important to Jesus and his disciples. There we read this verse uh, as it is uh, uh, quoted on the screen. For the Son of Man is the Lord of Sabbath day. So Lord Jesus Christ is calling himself as the Lord of Sabbath day. So he looked to himself and he revealed himself as Lord, not as a mere rabbi or like many other people, but he is the Lord of all indeed. Then uh, another one or two references also I would like to mention over here. Uh, <clears throat> when we come to the Mark chapter 11, and three, uh, again, that is a reference to uh, the, the uh, situation when our Lord was asking two of his disciples to go and prepare a room to, for the Lord and his disciples to have the Passover meal. And we know that it was there on that, in that upper room, the Lord's Supper was instituted. And regarding those things, we know that they were asked to go and meet a person and uh, uh, in that case, uh, Mark chapter 11, uh, before our Lord was uh, going to uh, Jerusalem, sorry, I just uh, 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 said in a different way, uh, there in Mark chapter 11, where our Lord was going to uh, Jerusalem as the triumphal entry of our Lord, there we can see that he wanted a call to be used by the Lord. And the uh, Lord asked the disciples to go and get the call. And as they were, uh, uh, losing that cold from the place where it was tied, then uh, we can see that many people, they came and asked, why you are losing this cold? And they had to answer. Lord himself taught them the answer. And they had to say that the Lord had need of this. So our Lord himself presented uh, there before uh, his disciples as the Lord. Again, uh, during the upper room, uh, when our Lord him, uh, was uh, washing the feet of his disciples, uh, and just after washing the feet, our Lord was trying to teach them something. So he uh, told them, John chapter 13 and verses 13 and 14, 
<coughs> we read how our Lord uh, mentioned them that you call me master and Lord. So he was acknowledging their, uh, uh, their mode of, uh, 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 of calling him as Lord. And he was accepting that. And he said that this, what you said is right. And if I being your Lord and uh, master, uh, I washed your feet, then you also have to wash your feet uh, among yourselves. So that is the meaning our Lord has given to himself. He presented himself as the Lord. And we have some other references also, but let me go uh, further. And let us always, uh, uh, always good to understand that our Lord himself presented as the Lord and the disciples called him Lord and they called him with the understanding that he is Lord means that he is God. So we, oh, it is good also for us to uh, look to him and uh, call him as the Lord. So that is the first thing I wanted to mention uh, in connection uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, in the uh, continuation of what we studied uh, last week, that is the divine titles, that Lord Jesus Christ is called God, uh, Lord, that means that he is God. And another thing that, uh, another title that we have to uh, uh, look upon is the title given uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, the, there we can see the angel of the Lord. That is a beautiful title given to uh, God uh, in the Old Testament. And we know that the word <coughs> angel, it, uh, uh, it speaks about the servants, the spiritual servants of our God. Uh, angels, we have, there are various uh, groups among them, like uh, Seraphim and Cherubim. And uh, God has got uh, thousands of uh, angels to serve him. We remember how our Lord mentioned uh, in connection with the, uh, the, his arrest, that if we ask the Father, the Father would send. Uh, 12 legions of angels. So he is the Lord of hosts and he is uh, having authority over the angels. So uh, there are so many angels uh, in the heavenly places to serve our Lord. But when we look to the Old Testament, we can see that in a singular way, the word angel of the Lord comes in the various scripture portions. We have a lot of reference, uh, but we are not going to uh, look to all these references in detail, but uh, we can see that there are certain areas where our Lord showed himself as the angel of the Lord. Now, before incarnation, there were times when God himself uh, manifested or revealed before people in various ways. We can we remember in uh, Genesis chapter 18, how our Lord revealed himself to Abraham as a man. Abraham saw three men coming to him and they had time of fellowship with him. And again, as they were leaving, we can understand that out of the three, two went to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah to the place of Lord uh, to destroy it. But we read that Abraham, uh, he stood in the presence of Lord. So out of these three men, one was Jehovah himself. So that was one way of God revealing to people just to communicate his, uh, his word to the people. But there are many other times we can see that our Lord revealed himself as the angel of the Lord. But we can understand very clearly from the context that the angel of the Lord mentioned over there is not a mere angel but it is God himself. When we look to the conversation in those places, we can understand how it is God himself. So uh, we have to understand and uh, we have to know that uh, the angel of the Lord the, that was mentioned in the Old Testament is a clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and another thing we can understand that, how can we, uh, distinguish this angel of the Lord from the angels uh, of, uh, uh, of the Lord. Uh, the main difference is uh, uh, there are times when this angel of the Lord, 
he speaks like God himself. And there are times when the people who met the angel of the Lord, they say like this, I have seen the Lord. I have seen Jehovah. So these are all clear uh, reference that says that the angel of the Lord is not a mere angel, but it is clearly the Lord himself. And there is another major <coughs> difference that never the angels of the Lord accepted worship. When we come to the book of Revelation, uh, our Apostle John, he wanted to worship God and he was uh, trying to worship the angel who revealed all these things before him. But we can understand that that angel was not willing to receive worship. He said that you have to worship God. I am just an angel, a servant. So he denied to accept the worship. He refused to accept the worship. But when we look to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, we can see that there are examples or instances when this angel of the Lord, he accepted the worship that is due unto Jehovah. So that says us clearly that this angel of the Lord is not merely an angel, but it is God himself. <clears throat> the first uh, reference to the angel of the Lord, we can see in connection with Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. And there we can see that Hagar was in a very desperate condition. And he came to Hagar. The angel of the Lord came to Hagar. And the angel of the Lord comforted and provided the way for Hagar in her distress. Then when we come to, uh, uh, in connection with uh, Abraham offering his son Isaac, we read like this, that the angel of the Lord intervened. And uh, there, the angel of the Lord, he commented what, uh, what Abraham was doing. So this angel of the Lord, there we can see that it is Jehovah himself. Because uh, when Abraham names that place Jehovah Jireh, he is not looking to a mere angel and saying that, but he is looking to God himself and clearly mentioning that I have seen Jehovah and Jehovah is the one who has provided all these things for me. We know the story of Moses and the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. There again we can see that the angel of the Lord coming and revealing himself before Moses. But there again we can understand that that angel was not a mere angel. Because as the communication went on, there the name that was revealed to Moses was the name of Jehovah himself. And there... The angel of the Lord, or Jehovah, he was commissioning uh, Moses to do that great work of redemption in connection with the children of Israel. In uh, connection with Samson, Judges chapter 13, again we can see how the angel of the Lord came and, uh, and counseled uh, the parents of uh, Samson, Manoah, and uh, his wife. So uh, there... They worshipped him. They brought offering and he received the offering. All these things says that how our Lord himself was there, uh, uh, there revealed as the angel of the Lord. Now, as uh, Manoah was worshipping, he wanted to know the name of the person who came and communicated. So he asked him, what is your name? So the angel of the Lord replied like this. Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is secret, or another way, seeing it is wonderful. And we know that that word wonderful is the very name given to our Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. So the same name which was revealed <coughs> to Manoah is the same person who was born as Lord Jesus Christ in this and uh, I, I just want to give you an uh, information that if someone is willing to say that this angel of the Lord is God the Father himself, that we can clearly know that uh, from John chapter 1 and verse 18, 
no one has seen god the father uh, no one has go seen god at any time so it was the duty of his begotten son the lord jesus christ to reveal and to represent god the father whenever uh, an interaction was made in connection with uh, people so let us <coughs> understand that what the uh, the title the angel of the lord which we see in the old testament is clearly an indication that it is none other than the lord jesus christ himself so that is another title we can see concerning the lord there are other titles also like uh, in the book of revelation we can see him uh, referred to as the first and the last the alpha and omega and all these titles uh, are about the lord jesus christ and it is a clear uh, indication that our lord jesus christ is god himself so i would like to come to the third point uh, uh, in this study of the uh, person of the lord jesus christ and that is the divine worship is ascribed to him all through the scripture as we look we can see that worship is ascribed only to god himself as i have just mentioned when john the apostle he wanted to worship the angel the angel refused it that is what we can learn from the book of revelation so the angel refused the worship and asked john to worship god when our lord jesus christ was in this world uh, uh, he always made it clear that worship the lord thy god and him only uh, as an answer to the satan uh, while he was uh, being tempted in the wilderness uh, the devil was asking him to worship him so that he can be given all the authority but lord jesus christ clearly told uh, the devil in matthew chapter 4 and verse 10 that worship the lord thy god and him only so god lord jesus christ was clearly teaching that only god is worship is worthy for worship so if we worship <clears throat> or if we pray to anyone other than god other than the triune god is an idolatry in the presence of god is a grave sin in the presence of god and we all know that in the book of romans as the apostle is narrating how the world is condemned before god he is saying that the first and the foremost thing is the people they knew god but they were <coughs> not ready <laughs> to ascribe him the due worship and the due honor and respect that we should have given to god so that was the basis of all the uh, declension and the deterioration we can see in this world people they were not ready to look to god and worship him instead they started worshiping the creation instead of the creator so uh, god is the only one who is worthy to be worshiped as far as the scripture is concerned so uh, when we see that there are times when people they were being worshiped by others godly men they always refused that that worship we know the story how peter was uh, about to be worshiped by cornelius uh, and his family they were they fell down at the feet of peter but peter said to them i am also a man like you so he was not ready to accept the worship even in the missionary journey of apostle paul and barnabas we can see that uh, there were times people wanted to worship them but they were not ready to accept the worship so all through the bible it is very clear that god is the only one who should be worshiped and there was no other person uh, in this world who is worthy of worship <clears throat> but when we look to the life of our lord jesus christ we can see that he unhesitatingly accepted such worship whenever people worshiped him he never refused to worship why is it because that he was uh, he was willing to be worshiped in spite of being a mere man no not at all 
he was god himself that's why he was willing to be worshiped when we come to john chapter 20 and verse 28 which we have uh, quoted a few minutes ago that thomas worshiped him the lord did not uh, did not uh, rebuke him but he accepted that worship when we come to matthew chapter 14 and verse 33 and again in luke chapter 24 and verse 52 there all we can see that our lord jesus christ was willing to accept worship so on one side lord jesus christ taught that only god is to be worshiped and on the other side lord jesus christ accepted worship what is the meaning if christ was only a mere man and he accepted worship that means that he is an impostor but if christ accepted worship and he is worthy for that that means christ is god himself so we have to come to either of these conclusions if he is a mere man and accepted worship then he is not true he is impostor but if he is worthy for that worship then he is not a mere man he is a true god and when we look to the whole character of our lord jesus christ as mentioned in the scripture we can gather that his character or his nature is not that of an impostor but it is of the true god so we can understand that or we can conclude that the one who has accepted worship he is god himself and lord jesus christ is god then <coughs> we can see that god himself wants the son to be worshiped we have ample references for that uh, in john chapter 5 verses 23 and 24 we read that god wants the son to be worshiped he also to be honored just as the father is honored then when we come to hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6 there we read how the son was uh, presented as an object of worship uh, let me read that hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6 and again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world he saith and let all the angels of god worship him see here god himself is saying that my son is worthy of worship jesus christ himself he did not refuse worship and the second aspect is god wanted his son to be worshiped and when we come to philippians chapter 2 and verse 10 we all know that there is a day that is coming when all those who are in heaven in earth and those who are beneath the earth they will come before the lord jesus christ they will bow their knee before him and every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is lord for the glory of the father so there again we can see that how god the father is allowing the people how god the father is allowing the creation to bow before his beloved son and to worship him so god wants his son to be worshiped and when we look to the practice of the first century people the apostles and the church early church we can see that they used to pray to the lord jesus christ and they used to worship him we can see uh, in second corinthians chapter 12 and verses 8 to 10 where apostle paul he was ha- he was having a suffering in his body and he had a thorn in his flesh we read that thrice he prayed to the lord so he was praying to the lord jesus christ so jesus christ was a person to him to whom he was praying and he was worshiping then again in acts chapter 7 we can see that uh, in connection with the the uh, the death of uh, stephen he was praying 
to the Lord Jesus Christ and asking him to receive his spirit. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, also we can see that people, they are calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans, we read in chapter 10, we read that they call on the name of the Lord and that is the way they are getting saved. So all these references are saying that Jesus Christ is the one to whom the early church, they, they depended or they looked to in prayer and he was being worshipped. So that says that our Lord was considered by God by the early church. Another aspect I would like you to notice is often we read in the New Testament a word called blessed. Now, in English, that word blessed has come from different Greek words. And one of those words is eulogetos. And another word is eulogeho. So <clears throat> wherever that word eulogetos is come, if we make a study of that word, we can see that there are only eight references for that word eulogetos in the uh, New Testament. And these eight verses, uh, in the eight places, that word is translated as blessed. But that translation or that word eulogetos is used not as a person who is blessed by God, not as a person who is a recipient of the blessing. That is not the thought there. But that word is a word of worship. For example, let us turn to the book of Ephesians, the epistle of Apostle Paul to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. There uh, we read like this, Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. See, there God, the Father, is mentioned as the one who is blessed. And again, we believers are also pictured as blessed people because we are uh, the recipients of the blessings of God. But the first word blessed, that is the translation of the word eulogetos. And when we trace that word in the New Testament, as I said, eight times this word is used. And always that word is used as a word of worship. It is uh, giving, ascribing worship to God, worship to uh, or praises to God. And we can understand that <coughs> Out of these seven references, one reference is clearly about Lord Jesus Christ. Out of these eight references, one reference is clearly about the Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning all the other seven references, we can say that it is about God the Father. But one reference is only about Lord Jesus Christ. We can read that in Romans chapter 9 and verse 5. There we read like this, actually, that was four and five goes together. But for the sake uh, of uh, uh, our uh, consideration, uh, we will come to verse five only. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. <coughs> See that word blessed is eulogetos there. And that word <coughs> is uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. So that word blessed is used there, or eulogetos is used there, along with God the Father in other places, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means that Jesus Christ is God himself. So they used to worship our Lord, and they, uh, they, they looked to him as God. And it is very clear from these references. Then <coughs> uh, I wanted to... Uh, go further and uh, with, the, with the rest of the time, uh, come to the next thing and let me conclude this point. The divine worship is ascribed to our Lord <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have The main things I have said is this, 
that all through the scripture, the worship is given only to God. And whenever the worship is given to other created beings, God looked to it as a grave sin. And he punished the people for that. And I'm not going into the details of those things, but we all know that. So our Lord Jesus Christ, he was being worshipped by people. And Lord himself uh, received worship without refusing it. God the Father, he wanted his uh, people to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And also the saints in the first century, they looked to the Lord Jesus Christ and worshipped him and they prayed to him. And in connection with that word, eulogetos, we have seen that that word is used only in connection with God the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the reasons we can say why Jesus Christ is, uh, is, uh, uh, is the uh, one who is uh, worthy for the worship. As well, our dear brother has asked for other references uh, in connection with uh, that word eulogetos, I would like to uh, mention it. <coughs> uh, when we, uh, please uh, note these verses. Uh, uh, Mark chapter uh, 14. And verse 61. Uh, then uh, Luke chapter uh, 1 and verse 68. Then uh, Romans uh, chapter uh, 9 and verse 5, which we have read. Uh, then chapter 1 and verse uh, 25. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 31. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. These are the uh, various uh, references where we have that uh, word, uh, eulogetos. <coughs> so let me come to uh, the fourth uh, uh, thing in connection with the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is uh, divine qualities are possessed by our Lord. Divine qualities are possessed by our Lord, and that is why we consider him as God. The three aspects we have seen because of his pre-existence, because of the names and the titles uh, are given to him, and divine worship is given to ascribe to him. Now, the divine qualities that are possessed by our Lord. <clears throat> we all know that what are the qualities of God the Father or God. When we uh, talk to people, in order to convince the vanity of their idea of God, uh, we usually reveal or explain uh, to them uh, what are the qualities of God. <clears throat> so the first one is God has to be eternal. God has to be eternal. That is the first quality. When we look to the word of God, we can see that God is pictured as the one who is ever existent. He was, he is, and he will be. That is that, that is the nature of God. So God who has a beginning, he cannot be a God. So God is an ever existing God. He is eternally from the past and he will be through eternity in the future. He has no beginning and he has no end. That is the quality of God. So we can look to the scripture and find out that this eternal nature is seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of those verses we have already discussed in that, uh, uh, in that uh, uh, title, His Pre-Existence. <coughs> but uh, within the short time, let me 
uh, uh, go through this in a very, uh, a very speedly, and we can just look to some of the verses. The most familiar verses is John 1 and 1, where we read that in the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, look to that phrase, in the beginning. That phrase is not saying that from the beginning, but says that in the beginning, that whenever you look to, look to the back and says that this is the beginning, God was already there. So that word in the beginning is not speaking of a starting point, but it speaks of a state that he is ever existent. So the word of God, who is God himself, and who is having a different person, personality, that is, uh, that is the one who incarnated. And again, that concerning that person, Apostle uh, John is saying that he was in the beginning. And let me <coughs> tell you that always uh, we are very, uh, we can, we have the limitations to understand all these uh, thoughts, but that the word in the beginning speaks about the state and it was not about any starting point. That means that he was there, uh, he was present eternally. In the book of Philippians, uh, in the epistle to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, we read like this, being in the form of God. Again, that word being, that means that he was ever existent. That speaks of his eternal state. Being in the form of God, <coughs> I'm not uh, going to uh, elaborate that verse or uh, to discuss that verse in detail, but let me tell you that it points to the existence of a person prior to what is stated of him. That is what W.E. Wine commented about that verse. He says that that word being is, it points to the existence of that person uh, uh, before <coughs> the point of time that we are talking about that person. And the same word being, we can see in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, being the brightness of his glory. Uh, this speaks of an essential nature, and it, it was there from all eternity. We cannot uh, uh, put a time limit for that. So our Lord Jesus Christ was from the past eternity that we can clearly gather from these verses. And what about his future eternity? Again, Hebrew chapter uh, uh, 1 and verses 10 to 12, uh, there we can see that about the, uh, the destruction of the creation and the permanence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we, are, we can see uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 10 to 12. Again, verse 12, let me, tell, uh, let me read the last part. But thou art the same, and thy ears shall not fail. Our Lord Jesus Christ will continue without failure. That is what we can see over there. So they, these are the verses that says that our Lord Jesus Christ was there from past eternity and he will be there till the future eternity. His eternality that we can gather and that is a quality of God. <coughs> then uh, another verse, uh, let me just mention and uh, proceed, that is, uh, John chapter 5, verses 21 and 26, where we read that Jesus Christ, uh, he uh, has a self-existence, means as the Father hath life in himself, uh, uh, Jesus Christ himself is having life in himself, and he gives life also, we can read there. Uh, John, chap John chapter 5, verses 21 and 26. Then about his immutability, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is an unchanging God. There is no change for him. Uh, we are well uh, versed with the Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, where we read that the leaders of the people of God, they may change. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the verse which we refer right now, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 12, we read that uh, uh, thou changest not. They shall be changed, but thou art the same. So our Lord Jesus Christ is immutable. He cannot be changed. And also we read 
in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ. The very essence and nature of God dwells in him. He was not merely God-like, but he was God. He is God and he will be God throughout eternity. So <clears throat> the divine qualities are possessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can conclude that Jesus Christ is God. Regarding the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have, uh, 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 we, uh, we wanted to meditate upon seven things. Now we have uh, looked to uh, four, uh, four, four important aspects and the remaining we can, uh, Lord, in the will of Lord, we can discuss in the next session. May God help us and uh, bless us with these thoughts and encourage us to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and to behold his glory and to live for him and to serve him in the days to, co in the days to come. May God's name be glorified.